Yes, he is. Um, I'm sorry. I've got supervisor short on the phone. He's he's trying to get in. He's attempting to. We'll 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 kind of drag our feet a little here and wait for supervisor short to join us. All right, Kylie, can you send that to him again, please? It, can you please take care of that? Thank you. Minor minor Zoom technical difficulties. I hear it's pretty common in the last month or two with a lot of folks. Kyle, you want me to resend him an invite? Yes, please. Please, if you could. Thanks. Well, I keep seeing people joining us, but not Darren. <laughs> and uh, he's item number two on our agenda. I don't know what to do about this. Valerie, did he say he was uh, in a rough connectivity area here? Or? Um, he just didn't get the uh, email for the to <laughs> sign in because we have that special sign in. So, yeah. uh, but the, it sounds like they're forwarding him that information now and he should be getting it. Okay, terrific. Now we see him. Hey, there he is. Thanks for joining us, Darren. <laughs> Couldn't start without you. Apologize right. for that. Sorry, no worry. late coming. We'll get started again. Kylie, can you please call a uh, roll? Supervisor Hemmingson? I am here. Supervisor Starkey? Here. Supervisor Short? Here. Supervisor Berkowitz? Here. Chair Howard? Here. All right, we're going to pause for a brief moment of reflection. Hey, Supervisor Short, can you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Certainly. Ready, salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, any new employees to announce here today, Neil? Not today, Chair Howard. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Joel, any uh, anything to report out of closed session? No, not today. Okay. Then at this time, I'd like to request any deletions, corrections, or additions from our board members to the agenda. Okay, seeing none, we're just going to go ahead and get started then on our brief reports. Supervisor Starkey, could you kick us off? Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, since we last met, I've attended a, the Visitors Bureau meeting. Uh, I attended the City Council meeting last Monday. That one was relatively short. It was only two hours, which is really record time for the City Council. Um, last night, I also attended their City Council budget workshop meeting. That was a little bit more of a marathon of what I'm used to with them, but it was interesting. It's interesting to see how they go through their budget process. Um, I spent a lot of time in the last two weeks researching the Mental Health Services Act. For those of you 
that might not be familiar, it was a tax that was passed in 2004 that taxed people that make over a million dollars to put toward mental health services in California. So I, I just researched as much as I can trying to learn how that money is allocated and how it can be spent. Um, I attended the solid waste management meeting. Uh, we were able to award Daphne Lambert the Green Ribbon Award for Outstanding Environmental Activism. Uh, Daphne la launched a program that uh, where the unhoused are cleaning up garbage and in the encampments around uh, Donart County. And since they started that program in April of this year, they've collected upwards of 10,000 pounds of garbage. And so that is um, quite a, an accomplishment and we appreciate her work on that. She is in need of construction quality garbage bags. So if you are wanting to help out with this program, you can donate some of those garbage bags. Um, we did, I did receive some community complaints about the garbage in the encampment above the uh, cemetery. And so within moments of me being tagged on Facebook by someone, um, Chief Griffin from CCPD contacted me and let me know that the city does have uh, plans to clean up that area. I asked for um, him to send an invite to the entire Board of Supervisors so that we can be part of this solution as well. Um, I think that is important for us to, to see exactly what's going on and help in the efforts to clean up and help come up with solutions to maybe avoid that in the future. Sometimes that's a very difficult thing to do though. I attended the Department of Resources Recycling and Recovery Re webinar. Um, as I've mentioned before, I'm very committed to learning everything there is to know about SB 1383. And this is just one more resource for me to, to get more information. I participated in the administration manual meeting and workshop. Uh, we are making a lot of progress toward updating the uh, manual and getting it workable for the county departments. I attended the food task force meeting. The mobile market truck is up and running and it's going to be wrapped with their logo. The mobile market is really a, a way to provide fresh produce to people in rural parts of uh, Del Norte County who are experiencing food insecurity. I attended a webinar on older Americans uh, virtual training for fraud risk. I think it's, um, again, as our population is aging, I think that we need to make sure we're looking out for our neighbors and our friends because there's a lot of scams out there that are getting more and more sophisticated every day. And so as long as we're aware of them, we can make sure we're looking out for the older people in our community. I attended the addiction studies graduation. It was an informal graduation uh, through the College of the Redwoods, but there now are six more uh, substance abuse treatment facilitators who are going to be getting jobs in our uh, community and providing those services. I attended the LAFCO meeting last night. It was pretty uneventful. I think we got done in record time, but what um, was important for me to, to note is over the weekend, I had a lot of questions about the fire districts. We have something on our agenda today and I really wanted to get the historical perspective of our fire districts and those reports that was prepared in 2015 by LAFCO was invaluable. And so I'm thrilled to know that we have that agency there. In 2021, they're gonna be doing MSRs on the fire districts again, the community service districts of Big Rock, Hunter Valley, Klamath, Redwood Park, and Gasky, as well as the Harbor District. So I look forward to reading those. I attended the Harbor District meeting. Um, again, I'm, I'm wanting to make sure that um, I'm kind of familiar with what's going on in each various uh, pod of our government here and locally, so that either we don't repeat services or that we collaborate on services that we can provide to the community. And finally, I attended a CSAC, which is the California State Association of Counties course called Dynamics of Change in County Government. Um, the course really should have been named How Stuff Works. It was a great course. It kind of walked through um, how to make changes in local government, the idea that you need to build the well before you're thirsty. Um, and so it's kind of looking forward at um, situations that could be occurring in our community, such as an aging population. Um, it is predicted that by 2030, we are going to have more people over the age of 60 in California than under the age of uh, 18. 
So those are types of things that we need to really kind of think about when we are imagining our parks or the services that are available to our community members is how our dynamics and our, our populations will change. So that is it for me. Thank you very much, Supervisor Starkey. Supervisor Short. Thank you, Chair. Um, since our last meeting, I attended the North Coast EMS uh, Medical Advisory Committee and Trauma Advisory Committee. Um, just a short note there, uh, the Humboldt County is having similar problems with their acute mental health services and how they handle um, 5150 patients. So we are, we are not in a, uh, in a bubble by ourselves handling this, this tough issue and we are working through solutions for that. Um, attended a walkthrough of the Delaware County Jail with Supervisor Hemmingson, um, where we noted many, uh, many maintenance issues that we'll be working on in the future uh, due to the, the building's age. Uh, with uh, Supervisor Starkey, I attended the Delaware uh, Solid Waste Management Authority meeting uh, I attended the Wildlife Conservation Board meeting where we talked about uh, uh, thinning operations in Humboldt and Del Norte counties. Uh, I attended Senator Mike McGuire's town hall on the, the drought situation in California. You may or may, or may not know that uh, uh, the governor has imposed uh, drought restrictions on state agencies here in Del, uh, Del Norte County. Um, attended the... Um, Last night, uh, as Supervisor Starkey said, Delner at LAFCO uh, meeting as well. And that is my report. Thank you, Supervisor Short. Supervisor Hemmingson. Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman Howard. Uh, yeah, I had a RCRC executive, which is the rural county representative, representative of California, uh, executive uh, meeting. Uh, I had a uh, a ramp uh, meeting, which is the uh, risk assessment uh, management uh, program uh, for Wales. Uh, and uh, uh, we made our recommendation, uh, the working group and the director uh, went a different, well, I, I should say went a different direction. He went along with the department's recommendation, which is to close the season effective June the 1st. So uh, crab fishing will cease on June the 1st. First, uh, which is uh, uh, about six weeks shorter uh, than the normal season, usually it goes till July 15th. I uh, had the opportunity to meet with uh, Gerhard Weber, the new Harbor Commissioner. Uh, fairly new to the area, but uh, seems to be getting a grasp on uh, the needs uh, of the Harbor. So uh, it was interesting to meet him. As uh, Supervisor Short mentioned, uh, along with County Council, he and I, or the, the three of us, had a walkthrough uh, of the jail, uh, seeing some uh, deficiencies uh, that need to be addressed. Uh, I attended the uh, Harbor Commission meeting uh, and uh, uh, had some uh, comments uh, and questions. Uh, for them, uh, had a uh, meeting with uh, Supervisor Howard and staff over some uh, resource uh, issues. And I had a Northwest Resource Conservation and Development meeting. And that's it for me. Thank you, Supervisor Hemmingson. Supervisor Berkowitz. Oh, thank you. Uh, as you probably know that I'm dealing with some medical issues and I want to thank uh, Supervisor Starkey for basically being me in some of these meetings that I have not been able to attend. I do want to talk about one issue and that is the horrible situation on the end of Waldo. Waldo as you know, is the entrance to the mobile home park. As you go through that mobile home park, you come along with just an absolute nightmare of garbage and burnt out mobiles and um, basically squatters everywhere you look. I got a hold of our code enforcement, uh, Mr. Mello. I uh, talked to him uh, several times about 
this kind of issue. Uh, he's frustrated because he just does not have all the resources that he needs in order to deal with this problem. So I think uh, that's something that I wanna continue to work on uh, as with all of the other areas that are seeing huge amounts of just junk and garbage along the roadsides. And that's my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Berkowitz. So it's, it's been a busy couple of weeks. Um, I do have some good news to report though. And um, I'll start off first with discussion with uh, Caltrans and Tamara Layton of the Del Norte Local Transportation Commission. Um, we first met Caltrans out at Elk Valley Crossroads in Highway 199 um, to discuss, you know, continued solutions and working towards a viable option for the county and the state and our community to, um, to uh, reduce the near misses in traffic collisions and loss of life, loss of property at that intersection. Um, just in the short period of time that we were there, which was about 25 minutes, we saw close to three near misses um, and it's ramping up as tourist season gets closer. Uh, we, we did push hard, hard for a solution um, that uh, Larry DP from the California uh, CHP suggested, which was pushing the um, northbound on, uh, on wrap from 101 onto 199 further north which would allow for more sight distance to that intersection where uh, the majority of incidents are taking place, but, um, and discussed other solutions. Bottom line is uh, we're working towards a collaborative effort where we could potentially use some money that is coming down through uh, the federal government to leverage state funds to work on a solution. I think Tamara is doing an incredible job to help get us there and uh, we'll see how that turns out. But the, the good news is after that, we visited um, uh, Timber Lane and Highway 101 at the Dollar General Store. And as you know, uh, Supervisor Hemmingson and myself have been talking about this for a great deal of time. Um, something we case at Dollar General at that location, specifically 101 in Timbers Boulevard, we met that criteria and we met it quite easily. And uh, David is going to move forward with the uh, getting this on the books, project design, which would include um, a northbound turn pocket onto Timbers and a, uh, also a pocket on the southbound side of 101 that should help reduce that area and those congestion problems significantly. And he's promised to do this in less than a year. So uh, that was good news. I really appreciate Supervisor Hemmingson's help to continue to push for this effort, especially at the North Deal meetings. And I believe we're, uh, finally going to get some good results there on our state highway system and uh, it couldn't come too soon. So I appreciate the continued patience of the residents that continue to use this unsafe area and continue to be vigilant until it's taken care of. Um, as Supervisor Hemmingson uh, mentioned, we did attend a Natural Resource Goals Committee meeting discussing a lot of public land issues, in particular the ones coming down uh, with some uh, new legislation around putting uh, additional lands into uh, wilderness. I know this has always been an issue on the plate of uh, Congressman Huffman, but also there seems to be signatories from um, Senator Padilla and Senator Feinstein's office. So we're trying to get some more communication there to fully understand what the direction of not only uh, our congressman is, but also our state senators in backing this proposed legislation. And uh, we got a lot of work to do there. Uh, had a conversation with Doug Osi, who's uh, throwing his name in the hat for, for the governor. And then also attended an event of the California Japanese Sister City Network recently, where Council General Mieda uh, basically recognized and gave uh, an award to Rikas and Takada, the city of Crescent City and the county of Del Norte for the strong uh, diplomacy and international relations that our two communities have had in bringing both our countries, the United States and Japan together over the last three years. It was a, a great recognition by the Council General and it was uh, well received by those in the audience. Um, I had hoped to have Council General here so you guys could all share in, in this great effort, but uh, that just wasn't in the cards for today. Um, 
Also uh, had a lot of discussion around the Board of Forestry rules where we're getting to the end of the 45 day rulemaking period. It, it really seems like we as part of CSAC and RCRC and every supervisor are gonna need to call these members of the Board of Forestry individually to make a difference on this rulemaking package or else we're gonna be slammed with some rules that just aren't gonna be workable for Del Norte County. And this could potentially become come on the heels of another bit of legislation that Senator Mike McGuire is trying to battle through, which is SB 12. Uh, Neil uh, Lopez did some digging on that last night with Karen Lang, our lobbyist down at, um, in Sacramento. And some of the language that's currently being considered is just unworkable for Del Norte County. And it, if they put us in a lot of these tiered approaches, I truly, like I've said, and uh, been on my uh, pulpit for, for the last several months, it's gonna shut down development here in Delano County. And we, we as a board need to continue being very vigilant and cognizant and continue paying attention to it from our lobby sides of both RCRC and CSAC. But it's, uh, it's very disappointing to see what's happening in, in a very siloed approach by the Board of Forestry. So let's make some phone calls guys and, and try to change some minds on these perspectives. Um, attended a, a meeting of the North Coast Regional Wa Air Quality Control Board where we passed our 2021-2022 uh, fiscal year budget. And then also dealt with some issues uh, concerning Big Flat and some property rates. In addition, um, attended a uh, meeting of the Cupertino Rotary Club where they asked us to present our story of the sister cities. Um, got a lot of tears from those folks and the 87 people in attendance and uh, really appreciate uh, Blake Enscore's help in giving that presentation. Um, was asked recently by the Del Norte Senior Centers to join their uh, board and I've accepted. I'll probably have to put that on the agenda for next time to get the blessing of our board to join that. But uh, I had hoped that Supervisor Starkey was gonna be able to join. I know it's a passion of hers, but it looks like I'm gonna have to be the one to uh, be on their board with some conflicts there. Um, let's see, I, I do want to thank uh, briefly both Supervisor Short and Starkey for really taking this mental health issue head on with our staff. It helps to have your perspectives as electeds and helping to uh, narrow down the options for the county and how best to treat this and also lets our staff know that the board's paying a, a great deal of attention to this. So really appreciate your time and effort on that. Did have a conversation briefly with Jesse Gilkoff from the governor's office about the governor's proposed budget and if there's any uh, pitfalls we need to pay attention to there. And I basically said, you know, I haven't dove into it enough to really figure out what's going on yet. Let me get back to you. Actually, let me get some opinions from the rest of our board too before I get back to you. And lastly, I'll end, uh, I did attend a, a funeral service for uh, Joe Borges. Joe was an incredible member of this community and uh, worked for the city for, for many years before that uh, reservation ranch. Uh, he, he always came with a team approach, no matter what the issue, helping not only the county roads department out on issues and, and joint collaborations, but Joe will be sorely missed and uh, all the blessings and prayers to his family in their time of healing. And that's all I have to report at this time. And I'd like to move now to our 1025 item, which is public comment. Members of the public may address the board on matters which are within the jurisdiction of the board. If you are addressing the board regarding a matter listed on the agenda, you may be asked to hold your comments until the board takes up that matter. Please limit your comments to three minutes or less. Kylie, is there any uh, public comment for today? Sure, I have one written. Um, do you want me to read that first or do you want me to go to online? Please go, go ahead. Okay, just give me a brief moment. I got to switch screens here. Are you no. guys still able to hear me okay? You, we sure can. Okay, so this is from Linda Sutter and it says, there are approximately seven RVs that are parked regularly overnight on South Beach. The one brown bus RV has been in Del Norte County three months with no change of registration. In fact, you can no longer see the license plates, which were Colorado plates. Since there is specific signage, along South Beach of no overnight camping. I would like to know why the Sheriff's Department is not making these folks move along. I'm sure the Coastal Commission would be interested to know that the county is allowing continued unauthorized overnight parking. In fact, the county might want to develop and request that this parcel of land 
be developed and start changing $40 per night to camp on our beach. After all, someone needs to pay for the wear and tear part of South Beach. Now for another thought. Since our kids were not allowed to attend school in Delmert County, but attend online classes, why are parents required to pay why parents are required to pay $69 per, mo per month for internet fees to attend online classes by Del Norte County School District. We pay taxes for our children to attend public school. This public school has failed our children in many ways, but why should we be forced to pay double the amount? The school district should be incurring the cost, not the taxpayer who is getting double taxed. Lastly, I thought of a way for Del Norte County to get national attention. Chair Howard is the best person for this job. It would only cost the county $3,000 or less. Chris Howard should run for governor for the state of California, and this is why. He understands how small counties are overlooked and how one size does not fit every county. He understands the needs of farmers and how depriving them of water will not only affect California, but the entire food chain that California farmers provide will affect the entire nation. Finally, Chair Howard, you understand the workings of the government in policy, procedure, regulations, and law. You are not one of these career politicians stuffed in a fancy suit. And there you go. You have a platform. Sincerely, Linda Sutter. And I have online, give me one moment. Robert, you are on. Hello. Hi guys, can you hear me? Good morning, Robert. Hi, Here's it's Robert. Morning. I, I just uh, I just wanted to speak up just because uh, about a month ago or so, like uh, some of our neighbors, the, the Talala put out that they were seeking support uh, in some manner to reacquire some of their lands back. And, uh, you know, I don't know how far it's gonna go, but I just wanted to speak up for my support for the county to somehow ally with them uh, to reach their goal. I was reading about the parcel that they were hoping to get back and I was kind of immersing myself in county history. And when you read the dial diary entries from the 1860s, you can see that the property had started out as a slave plantation over and over again. The diary entries would say, uh, you know, uh, superintending 40 Indians plowing potatoes and. 17 children in the garden doing this and that. And uh, Mr. So-and-so went into the hills to search for runaway Indians. And that would be the journal entries over and over again is a manner of supervising Indians work on the land and then capturing them, you know, right after within about a decade or so, several massacres in that area. And so I just wanted to you know, speak up for my support. You know, I know the county put it on their agenda uh, in September is on the consent agenda to, to recognize, um, you know, Native American genocide and that kind of thing. And, you know, there must be some meaningful ways to, um, to bring that proclamation to life. Um, I just uh, advocate for the county to investigate how they might uh, serve that sort of interest. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Chair, I'm not seeing any more online uh, public comment. Okay. No, I, I do appreciate that, Kylie, for taking a look at that. And uh, let's see, it is now 1030. I'd like to go to uh, public comment with, uh, no, sorry, not public comment. <laughs> That's our report from Dr. Raywald. Doctor, I see you are with us today. Uh, please join us if you can. This is lovely. Good morning. Ready. Can you hear me? We sure can. Good. Um, well, I'll keep my report fairly brief because uh, there's not been a whole lot of news since the last time you met. The biggest uh, difference, I think, is today is the first day of uh, the new vaccination service provided by the state through OptumServe. Uh, so you might remember from some of our announcements, they're taking over the operation at the fairgrounds for us on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. They're actually going to extend the hours so it'll be available from 10 to 7, which is good for people who are working and are finding it hard to get away from work and may want to come get vaccinated. Uh, a little rough at the beginning today. Um, there's some supply issues that materialized overnight that we're fixing as we speak. Uh, so I think they'll be up and running today, but I, I really don't know how, uh, how much business they are expecting or how much we're going to expect. They are still using Moderna vaccine. Um, and they will continue using Moderna for the foreseeable future. Uh, we do have some clinics upcoming, which will include Pfizer vaccine. Uh, we have a clinic tomorrow actually with Pfizer at uh, our health department. 
So we are relocating as they locate into the fairgrounds. Uh, I think we have another clinic on, I better check my schedule here real quick <laughs> before I misquote. Another clinic on June 8th with Pfizer at the fire hall, which is an afternoon evening clinic. Uh, that'll be followed by other clinics uh, later on in June at the same location. And then Sunday the 13th, we have uh, Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J uh, &J vaccine, which will be done out at Smith River at the school gym. Uh, we're hosting another clinic out there. So we're not getting out of the vaccination business, but we're letting the state take over uh, kind of the steady availability at the fairgrounds, which everybody knows about and uh, has been moderately successful. I mean, we just have seen a real die off in interest in the vaccine lately. And, and I've reported that before that has not changed. We still have relatively low numbers of people getting vaccinated. It's not just us. It's pretty much across the board uh, with our partners as well. Uh, there's been a little bit of interest since Pfizer got here because that enabled uh, some younger folks to get vaccinated. And honestly, our biggest interest group right now is uh, teenagers and their parents. So that's one of the reasons we want to set up these extra Pfizer clinics and extend the hours, make it a little bit easier for people to get in. Our case numbers have been pretty steady, uh, kind of uh, generally downtrending. We still have some busy days, but the last week or so, our experience has been pretty good. We've probably averaged about two or three a day, uh, which for us is still more than we'd like, but uh, it's manageable, certainly. Uh, case numbers at the hospital have been between zero and three. I think we have three people there this morning. I think a couple are being discharged today. Um, so more or less about the same in terms of activity and the impact on the hospital. Um, you know, there is all the national news that people have heard about, especially the CDC guidance about masking uh, and how that impacts things. And the state of California's decision to hold their masking in place at least till the 15th of June. And, you know, on June 15th, a lot's going to change. Um, they're still going to recommend personal protection as we will for, especially for people who are not vaccinated. It's still not a safe place to be out in the world. And, until you've been vaccinated. And uh, we still encourage everybody to think it over and think about getting that shot. Um, some interesting data from the state is probably gonna be published in a week or so. Since January, they've only had among about 18 million people vaccinated. They've only recorded uh, about 4,000 people in the hospital from COVID. And no, not, that's not right. 4,000 cases of COVID and only about 270 people in the hospital and only 30 people died. So, I mean, you can still have cases of COVID after vaccination, but out of 18 million, that's really small. And over the same time frame, we've lost uh, over 25,000 people from COVID who were not vaccinated. So, I mean, that's, the, that's a stark difference. And I, I think people need to start understanding that in a, in a real way and how, how much a difference it makes to get the vaccines. Um, I don't think I have anything else this morning. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Any questions for Dr. Raywall at this time? Um, I, I don't have a question. I just, I did some research this morning and it's the internet, so I don't even know how, how valid it is. But um, the statistics are showing that in Donart County, we have 62% uh, of our 65 and olders that are fully vaccinated. So I felt that that was positive news. Um, I know that our numbers are ultimately lower than we'd like to see them, but I felt the population that we're most concerned with our elderly, that that was positive news. Is, is that about what you believe it to be? Yes, yeah, and, and I agree. It's a, it's a positive news item because that is the most vulnerable population has been from the beginning. We were hoping to get a little higher, you know, two thirds or maybe 70% ultimately. And we may still see that. I mean, we know there's some people who may change their mind and decide to get vaccinated uh, or are sort of on the fence about it yet for whatever reason. So yeah, I, I, I think that's a, a key take home message is that over half our seniors have been vaccinated at this point. And that, that's always good to know. So one of the questions I had Dr. Raywald, and this is, might be asking you to take a look at the crystal ball a little, but um, you and your staff devoted an incredible amount of time to this tracking piece, the 
How, how do you see this actually rolling forward with some of the changes being proposed at the state level? I mean, has that been discussed much amongst the CDC? Well, they uh, have polled the counties about whether we are starting to dial back any tracking or any case investigation. Um, you know, a lot of counties were you know, 12 hours a day, you know, seven days a week, really full bore activity because they had a lot of work to do. We got to almost that point. I mean, we had, uh, we, we dedicated some staff to work on weekends and, you know, tried to keep the coverage going, you know, seven days a week. Whether that's going to need to happen in the future, we don't really know. I think as long as the, we consider it a state of, uh, a declared state of emergency, they'll want us to continue doing case investigation. At some point, it becomes more of a routine case investigation. Uh, I don't think we're there yet. I think that's several months down the road at, at the least. Uh, you know, waiting until more people get vaccinated or more people get vaccinated or more people get infected and recovered. And, you know, hopefully that'll provide enough herd immunity. So, yeah, there's, uh, there's too many unknowns really to answer that question accurately. I think, I think we're in this game at least for a few more months, you know, trying to keep a lid on things. And, you know, it, it has worked really well for our county, I think. Um, but, uh, and you don't wanna stop what work, what's working <laughs> too soon because that's usually a mistake. Understood. So. Well, that's why we rely on your, your expert opinion, doctor. There was one other thing I was gonna mention to, to this group because I meant to mention it last time I presented to the board. And you may have heard because the word has kind of gotten out that I am going to be stepping down as health officer. Um, my last day will be at the end of June, June 30th. Um, so I just want to make it official, officially let you know, because uh, you know you 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 folks uh, have been of immense support to us, and and I've felt like you've been supporting everything we've been doing since the beginning, and I really appreciate that. So I wanted to let you know, in particular, uh, that I will be moving on. Um, and I, I made a promise to myself and my wife that I would be getting out of public health. I made that promise over a year and a half ago, and I, I finally have to keep it. So it's time. Probably a good idea. Probably. <laughs> you will be missed, um, but we'll talk more before you go. But I just wanted to, to acknowledge that you are going to be missed. So thank you. I appreciate that. Let's, let's go ahead and open it up for public comment. I'm just gonna give it a couple more seconds, Chair. You bet. I'm not seeing any public comment at this time. Okay, well, then it looks like we're good to go. Thank you, uh, Dr. Raywald, for continuing to join us and keeping the community up to speed. Thank you, I'll see you next time. You bet, have a great day. All right, well, it looks like it's uh, 1040 and we do have another timed item, which is the U.S. Capitol Christmas Tree Project update. I believe Ted MacArthur is with us today in the audience. Ted, are you with us? I am. Hey, good day. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about the project? Absolutely. And first of all, I just want to thank uh, all, all the honorable board members for, for giving us some time today. Um, I apologize. I'm, I'm in transit to uh, annual Provide an opportunity to um, share share about the Capitol Christmas tree and and um, invite uh, uh, participation. Uh, uh. Hmm. We've got Ted going in so and out. Here. What's that? You're going in and out, Ted. I'm afraid it's uh, cutting, okay. Cutting you off. Can can I can I turn it over to Samantha Rijo? You you sure can. Good morning, everyone. My name is Samantha Rijo, and we had a backup just for that reason because um, our forest supervisor is on the road. Um, my name is Samantha Rijo. I work in the regional office here in California. I'm based in the Bay Area, but I'm also the spokesperson for the U.S. Capitol Christmas Tree product and is, and is responsible for all communications efforts. So my plan today is to provide a quick update and overview of the Capitol Christmas Tree program and invite your questions. With the permission of the board, can I share my screen? Please see if this works. Can you please, can you see the screen? 
Not yet. Oh boy. <laughs> no worries. Take your time, Samantha. I apologize. Can you see you now? We can. All right. So thank you with this time. I'll take a few minutes just to quick, provide a quick overview of the U.S. Capitol Christmas tree program. Um, you can see here, I wanna um, quickly share with you the, our logo, which we are immensely proud of. Six rivers, many peoples, one tree. That is the, the theme that we are working off of this year, obviously drawing attention to the Six Rivers National Forest many peoples as it talks um, the needs of inclusivity and diversity within our forests, as well as within the US Forest Service. And obviously one tree, that is our mission to bring a beautiful tree to Washington DC by Christmas. It is jam packed with imagery. And I'll take just a few seconds here to share some of the, um, the biggest elements within the logo itself. Obviously red and green to highlight the Christmas holiday theme. You can see the rainbow of peoples um, that shows that the, that the national forests are for everybody, every creed, race, religion, old, young, able, disabled. We invite all people to be able to enjoy the outdoors and the beautiful Six Rivers National Forest. You can see the six colors of the rivers representing obviously the Six Rivers um, National Forest itself. A beautiful salmon fish, the endangered Lassic Lupin, um, which is prominent in that area as well as drawing your attention to a tribal element. You'll notice that there are 113 white and red ornaments on the Christmas tree. 113 ornaments represent the tribes recognized within the state of California. And the 16 red lights represent the 16 tribes that are recognized within the Six Rivers and who call the Six Rivers their ancestral home. The tree skirt um, was, um, that design was given to us by permission of a local tribe for a native basket cap as well as the border outlining in red is a traditional um, friendship um, border design that was given to us by a local tribe as well. So there's a lot of elements strand packed in here, obviously to show the beautiful region, um, which Dor Del Norte is obviously a part of, as well as just the entire Six Rivers. Moving forward, what are we here to do? We're charged with providing one large U.S. Capitol Christmas tree. That tree will be between 60 and 80 feet tall. It will be the biggest, fullest tree that we can find within the forest itself that will be delivered to the Capitol um, sometime in late fall. With that, we are also charged with providing additional 125 to 130 smaller companion trees. Now those trees will outfit the California delegation of the House and Senate chambers, as well as to beautify different federal office buildings within DC to include the Department of Agriculture and the Department of the Interior. And those trees need decorations. We put out a call about a month ago, actually earlier this month, requesting 15,000 handmade ornaments by Californians. 4,000 of those will be on the outside Capitol Christmas tree that obviously have to be made of materials that can withstand DC rain and snow. And the remaining 11,000 will beautify the indoor offices. And for those trees that are gonna be inside, we're requesting tree skirts as well. But it's not just providing a tree to Washington, DC. We are gonna be going on a, about a five week whistle stop tour throughout the entire state of California and before making our way over to Washington, DC with a lot of the local events that we're planning that will obviously culminate with Celebration Week in Washington, DC. On top of that, as everyone well knows, we are being very, very mindful of what we can do in this new normal environment as vaccinations become more prominent, but obviously keeping safety um, and the safety of uh, not only our employees, but the safety of folks who come to events at the forefront of our minds. Moving forward, I shared this already, where our intent is to find the biggest, shiniest, fullest, best, prettiest, tallest, close enough to a road that we can access tree for um, the U.S. Um, Capitol's West Lawn, and obviously to showcase the Six Rivers and its peoples. Moving forward, you can see very quickly here just some of the milestones that we are working off of. We've already um, put out a call for ornaments and skirts, and we invite anyone that's on this call, and specifically the board, if you're interested in, in showcasing Del Norte specifically um, by providing ornaments or skirts, we would certainly love to have that. We're in the process now of having rangers going out and identifying candidate trees that will be selected by the representative of the architect at the Capitol who comes in mid-July. Between then and October, we'll be 
very busily preparing, doing some local events and some press around the communities up there before we actually harvest the tree on October 23rd and launch a few days later. So moving forward here, how you can join in, as I mentioned earlier, ornaments and skirts, hosting a tree event. Um, I wanna give specific shout out and thank you to Cindy Vosberg, who I, I believe has been our, our conduit um, with, with Del Norte and has provided some assistance and support in providing um, in the potential for hosting an event in, Cres in Crescent City or even Klamath when we start our tour around October 27th. At this time, I'm happy to take your questions and I also invite my colleague, Nancy Henderson or even the Forest Supervisor, Ted, if he's able to, to provide any additional add-ons. Pending your questions, this is Nancy Henderson. I'm actually the lead for this project and, and very grateful that Samantha so graciously took this call for me this morning as I just hours ago came off of a two week leave. But I wanted to really highlight uh, what Cindy is, is doing and wants to do for us. We want to start our cross country tour uh, at the very tip of, of California up in Crescent City, provided that we can get the tree, uh, all 120 feet of truck and trailer through last chance grade. And I think Cindy is so committed to that, I would not be surprised if there were a road fail, she would probably be out there with a teaspoon trying to clear it. Um, so we, and I know she would appreciate involvement and support as she puts together an event in Crescent City and possibly Klamath as well. What that looks like, think of it as a community party. The community chooses what the party looks like, just as a mom chooses what a kid's birthday party looks like. And you, you choose the invitees and the decorations and the food and, and the entertainment, except we bring some of the entertainment. Um, think of us, I used to say as a clown, but let's just say as a magician, we show up, we do our thing, we have some interp, we ha let the kids and adults sign the banner that's on either side of this tree. It's just a big happy thing. And then we go away. But what the shape of your community event looks like is up to you because it's your event. So um, Cindy's all over that, but know that, that we fully support and want to be absolutely inclusive of Del Norte County um, any way we possibly can in this. So questions? Any questions from the board? I don't have any questions, but I want to say that I'm extremely excited about this. I do work um, on the chamber. I'm um, going, once our 4th of July celebrations are over, we're going to shift gears into a community celebration for this tree with Cindy. That's so awesome. um, it is going to be an exciting event in our community. I've already called last chance grade, said let's figure out how we can get this across because I think it would be really important for it to start here in Crescent City. But if that's not the case, we will figure out something and we will still celebrate. So thank we you sure for all of your hard work and in, including um, us and all this information too. Well, thank you, Supervisor Starkey. And a shout out as well, not just to Cindy, but also to Stacy and Sarah, um, Supervisor Hammondson. Uh, at RCRC. We're working extensively with them as well, and uh, they're, they're all on board as well. So good to know. Yeah, and I'm sure the board shares and Supervisor Starkey's uh, comments and reflections there. Uh, we do appreciate your time, Nancy and Samantha, okay. and for joining us today and, and sharing this effort with us, and we'll participate, I'm sure, in any way we can. Um, before you guys leave, I do need to open it up for public comment, just in case we have... Uh, some comments from the folks in Del Norte County. Uh, Kylie, can you check on that for us, please? Chair, I'm not seeing any hands raised at this time. Great, okay. Well, you guys are getting off easy today and we do uh, really appreciate the presentation and uh, thank you for uh, thinking of us as we move forward with this great little project for our community. Thank you for your time. I'll plan on putting our social media um, information into the chat box for a, for a follow, but thank you so much for your time and for the board's time. You bet. Thank you very much. Have a great day. All right, it is 1050 and we're gonna go ahead and move to our last time item, which is a uh, update from Del Norte Ambulance. And I believe we have uh, John Pritchett with us today. I believe I saw him in the audience. So it looks like we also have uh, Mr. Sandler too. Good morning to both of you. 
Morning. Morning. All right. Who, who gets to take this, take the lead here? Well, let me go ahead and uh, start off. Uh, greetings, and I, I want to thank you for letting us come and speak with you today about our services and what we've been up to over the last year. Um, in 1985, when I, I first came to Delaware County to make it my home, uh, Delaware Ambulance had one full-time and one part-time ambulance that was, uh, or one crew that was working out of three well-used ambulances and uh, to, out of one station. Today, we're providing uh, ambulance service uh, out of three ambulances, well-maintained, well-staffed, well-equipped, out of two stations, 24 hours a day. We're also providing a wheelchair service uh, that we saw a need for and, and we're able to make that happen. But a lot more of that uh, information will, will come here in just a second. Um, in the mid-2019, uh, I entered into an agreement with Metro West uh, Ambulance uh, owner, and um, they're the largest provider in all of Oregon. Uh, having a big brother like Metro West was able to uh, help us gain access to services and support that, that our service was never able to make before. Um, and it's been able to add um, a great deal of resources to our community, which I'm very happy for. Uh, that couldn't have happened a minute too soon. Uh, as you know, 2019 has it ended, uh, 2020 came in with uh, some major problems. Um, with the Metro West support, we we're able to not only maintain our routine day-to-day uh, -day mission, but also to uh, be able to focus on um, um, dealing with whatever hits that COVID may have brought to our community and be able to support uh, the entire response plan for the community. Um, so that, that really came in to be a lifesaver for us uh, in that time frame. But this is just kind of a quick overcap. John Pritchett put together a nice four hour presentation for you. So just kidding. Just we'll have to cut him off early then, uh, Ron. If that's an exaggeration. I'll get this done in 90 minutes tops. <laughs> uh, uh, but again, uh, you know, I, I wanna thank the board for, for its ongoing support of, of the EMS services in Delmar County uh, for years since 1985, since I first got here. Uh, we've always had a good program going and uh, we've worked well together and, and I look forward to doing that for many more years to come. Um, but John can kind of give you a whole depth of, of what we've really been up to in the, in the nitty gritty stuff. So John, it's all yours. Thank you, Ron. Uh, this past year has been one filled with challenges and with growth. And we've worked hard to continue improving our service for the benefit of the residents and visitors of our community. And we are very excited about the changes coming in the near future. Now, Ron touched bases on our relationship with Metro West, which proved invaluable over the past 12 months. During the heart of the COVID crisis, three of our paramedics contracted the virus. And for a small company, that's a loss. However, medics from Umpqua Valley came and with permission of North Coast EMS, filled in for several days with no reduction of service to the community. And with Metro West buying power, we've been able to add to our equipment list, which we'll talk about shortly. Ron touched on the wheelchair van which uh, we brought online uh, in the fall of uh, 2020. It makes approximately 80 transports per month now, taking individuals to doctor's appointments, dialysis and oncology treatments, and to regional veteran administration facilities. This product filled a major need in our community, and DNA is actually considering adding a second unit to that fleet. We also continue to use the bariatric ambulance for those patients in need of that service, which also provides us with another backup ambulance when needed. Delmar Ambulance has been and remains actively involved in COVID-19 agency short and long-term planning, working with the medical community and with Delmar County. We've also provided standby uh, help during vaccine administration when possible at no charge. Now for years, Delmar Ambulance has had a mutual aid program established with all the services that surround the county. Thanks to that program, Delmar Ambulance was able to seamlessly shift coverage of the Klamath area to Arcata Mad River Ambulance during the blockage of U.S. Highway 101 at last chance grade. And we continue to coordinate with Caltrans so our units can get through and then get back during those two-hour shutdown periods. Delmar Ambulance crews now have access to an unlimited amount of online training while we continue to offer in-house continuing education credits to our crews. Now, speaking of education, one of the biggest challenges we've faced is that there is no paramedic class in Delmar County. People had to drive to College of the Redwoods on the other side of Eureka to go to classes two to three times a week. Well, that's no longer the case. Delmar Ambulance and Metro West is now offering its own online paramedic course. 
We currently have two EMT basics enrolled with more to follow. This will allow us to grow our own paramedics and thus have to rely less on recruiting paramedics from outside the region. This is an earn while you learn program that we believe will be highly beneficial to the community for years to come. We've also reestablished our Explorer program following the COVID-19 crisis, allowing young people to serve the community, to learn about a future career in EMS and to have some fun. Now I talked about the new equipment that we've added. This includes updated easy IOs, allowing paramedics more, way to, more ways to administer medications. We've added eye gels, which provides another type of advanced airway treatment. We're currently testing something very cool, video laryngoscopes, allowing for easier intubations in the field. We've added new medical supply systems, AKA med bags, which allow us crews to bring specific items to scenes easier. We've added laptops, allowing easier transmission of information to hospital personnel. And we are in the process of adding automatic vehicle locators, allowing for real-time access to where each ambulance is located, allowing for better use of resources. It also allows each ambulance to have a cellular network, allowing for faster transmission of information to doctors and medical facilities. Now, we wanna say a quick word about our personnel. Delnard ambulance crews have worked tirelessly during perhaps one of the most stressful, potentially dangerous times in their careers. Our crews at times have worked hours wearing masks and uncomfortable personal protective equipment, often running extended shifts away from their family and friends. While many industries shifted to a, a home-based workforce, Delnord Ambulance and the first responders of our community continue to make house calls nonstop in the midst of a pandemic that has cost the lives of more than a half million people nationwide. Now, coming in the near future, we have three new four-wheel drive units coming online soon, giving us better versatility and a higher level of crew safety. This is gonna be especially important during uh, the winter months when we're taking patients on long distance transfers to Medford, Reading, Sacramento, and the Bay Area. We expect these units to be uh, in service this summer. We're optimistic that the new OSGI oxygen generating device will be available and operational this year. This will allow Delnord Ambulance and the other agencies of our community to be more self-sufficient during disasters and pandemics. Currently, O2 is provided by Eureka Oxygen out of Humboldt County, which is obviously problematic during difficult situations. Delnord Ambulance is going to continue to work with North Coast EMS on the advanced EMT program. We've talked about this before, which will provide a higher level of skills than EMT basic. North Coast EMS actually, <clears throat> excuse me, approved us for a pilot program just before the, uh, the pandemic hit. So we're gonna be gearing up for that program again shortly. Uh, one of our goals is to increase the level of care provided by first responders in outlying areas. Now, thanks to a determined and seemingly two year effort uh, by Charles Tweed and myself, Delnord Ambulances are now in talks with Medi-Cal and Partnership Health Plan that would allow us to transport some mental health patients via a secure car. Now we believe this will really help uh, the behavioral health department, Sutter Coast Hospital's ER, and most of all, the patient by providing more comfortable and secure transport to Redding, Red Bluff, Yuba City, Sacramento, and the Bay Area. For the community, it's gonna mean that there's gonna be more ambulances that'll be staying in Delnar County, serving the residents of our community and the change we're most excited about. With the help of the Dillnert Sheriff's Department and with the approval of uh, Sheriff Apperson, we'll be moving dispatch services to Bay City's dispatch. Now, how will this work? The initial car call will still come in via 911 to Dillnert Dispatch. You'll push, they'll push a button, it gets transferred to Bay City's. Bay City's highly trained team will then take the call and dispatch our crew using the latest technology. Members of that team are already in training and learning the community. Delnord Dispatch will still have uh, still be part of the system, able to coordinate additional resources if needed. Bay City's Dispatch actually already handles several systems in this manner with excellent results. And this system is used nationwide in many markets and by many co uh, companies and agencies, including AMR, Falk, CHP, and Cal Fire. One of the most important parts of this change will be reducing the overwhelming workload on Delnord Dispatch personnel. 
As you know, Dispatch locally deals with almost two dozen different agencies. With this shift, Delmar moving to Bay Cities, Delmar Dispatch will see a reduction in about 24,000 radio transmissions that Delmar Dispatch must respond to. This will help reduce the number of transmissions that get stepped on or lost by DNSO, local fire departments, and other law enforcement agencies. Delmar Dispatch will remain in place as backup and be able to provide information as needed uh, uh, to the the crews. Uh, What makes this um, project even more exciting is that these will be EMD trained dispatchers. EMD stands for Emergency Medical Dispatch. And along with sending resources to someone in need, these dispatchers will be, will be able to provide life-saving information to the caller. This would include how to perform CPR, how to perform abdominal thrust to a choking victim, bleeding control, even how to deliver a baby. EMD is used literally around the world, and we're very excited after a two-decade quest to bring this service to our community. North Coast EMS will continue its oversight of the program and in fact, will give final approval of the dispatch plan. Now the bottom line. Under contract, Delnard Ambulance was allowed, should it wished, to request a rate increase in July of last year. We did not, nor do we expect to request an uh, increase this year as well. So on behalf of Mr. Sandler, thank you for this opportunity. As always, any member of the board, and Mr. Lopez, you're invited as well to take part in a ride along with with one of our crews to see what it's really like in the field. Contact me to schedule. And with that, we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you, John. Thank you, Ron. Um, John, I gotta reflect back real quick and ask some questions on this last point specific to dispatch. as you're probably aware, uh, staff and, and uh, board members have been paying a great deal of attention over there to the needs of the sheriff's department. Sounds like you through Delano Ambulance are probably lifting some of the, the weight as you put it off of dispatch there. Um, do, you, I, do you have the call volume? I mean, you, you, you referenced some numbers there. Do you guys have the call volume that comes in if you don't an ambulance, what percentage again that does it make up of the dispatch request? Well, you figure every trans every every call generates uh, about seven to eight transmissions, uh, where we're letting the uh, dispatch know that we're responding, we're on scene, we're leaving scene, we're arriving uh, at the hospital. We are now uh, clear to go on calls again. So that's where that's that's why that number is so big, and we're going to be taking that burden off. Uh, local dispatch. Uh, absolutely, we have the call volume. Uh, just to kind of, I think to answer your question a little bit more, um, we're probably the second uh, biggest user of the system after law enforcement combined. Um, they have more radio transmission than, than we do, um, but then we're probably the second busiest uh, emergency services in the county um, because we're not only doing all the emergency response for 911, but we're also doing all the facility transfers and long distance transfers and, you know, move ups and so forth. So all those, each of those take a uh, transmission. So. Yeah. I, I, I asked this because we kind of dove into this quite deep because, you know, we're, we're paying attention, especially to dispatch and the ability to have enough dispatchers on at any one time during high periods of call volume. So we're really looking at how that impacts not only the, the need for the sheriff to dispatch to where he needs to get people to, but he's also mentioned this service that John reflected upon with having somebody that's capable of uh, uh, doing the minor emergency type uh, recommendations over the over the phone, um, treating for that choking victim, how to do CPR. I think that uh, this service, as John's now saying, uh, provides that. Um, I see that as a, as a pretty big deal here. Um, curious, what's it costing you to have this service now available and, and take that off of the sheriff's plate? And where does that money come from in your budget? Well, well, again, um, first of all, our goal is to keep Delmar Dispatch as a backup. So our, our annual commitment to uh, paying for the service will stay the same. So we're not going to cut anything from them that way. 
as far as moving towards um, Bay City's uh, dispatch system, that's part of that uh, bigger package of being uh, the big brother of Metro West. They're part of the Metro West family. So they're able to add us for, it's just, we're so small compared to everything else they're doing that it's, it's just like, oh, yeah, we'll throw it in. Um, so for them, it's, it's gonna actually en enable our system to be seamless from, from call start to call end once we get the dispatch system, the CAD system, the uh, patient reporting systems will all be integrated into one. So the dispatcher will be able to see where the ambulance is, the reports will be generated all within that same system instantaneously. Okay. And then I had one other question, and, and I apologize for the discomfort that this may raise, but yesterday we received communication from Dan Bratton, uh, Calor, um, to the entire board, uh, terminating a, an agreement that you guys have had in place for quite some period of time, and it was uh, generated based on uh, response time, essentially delivery of patients from what I could ascertain from either the hospital for, or from wherever to... Uh, their flight service. Um, I, of course, I didn't see any response, uh, and I'd love love to hear Delnort's side of the ambulances piece of this story. Well, we we just got this information yesterday afternoon, also, um, and you know we're always looking to be better. At everything we can do, um, we just got this, and we're looking into it. We're diving into it. And we're going to try to figure out the best way to resolve it. Um, I just wish that if if they've been tracking these issues since January that um, they'd sent us this, this information January, February, so we could have worked on it a little sooner. Sure. Um, it appears from their letter that uh, they're looking at moving out of a relationship with us no matter what. Um, so even if we were to, to be perfectly mitigating the issues, it looks like that their, their goal is to, to move out. John could probably address that a little bit more um, since he's been dealing with some of those issues. Okay, thanks, Ron. Yeah, I agree with Ron. It's uh, you know, it's something where if there, there's an issue, we want to know about it. We want to know about it as soon as possible, not six months down the road. And um, you know, the AMR Reach Corporation can end the contract uh, without any reason, without any at any time. It's their prerogative. Uh, but Donor Ambulance remains committed to doing what's best for what we consider our shareholders, and that's the people of Delaware County. Okay. Yeah, sorry to bring that up, but it was a question that I wanted to ask today because it's uh, fresh on our minds and, and you're here. So I appreciate you diving into that. Um, it yeah. was perfect timing. Okay, very good. Mr. Chairman? Please, Supervisor. Yeah, yeah uh, Ron or John or whoever. Um, uh, explain a little bit about, more about this dispatch service uh, if if I'm calling 911, they're going to know who to get a hold of. And is that going to, is there going to be duplicative services or reports? Uh, is this going to go to both dispatches? What's, explain the, the uh, give me the sequence of events if I call 911. So what, what uh, we're looking at is when you dial 911, it will come to the Del Norte Sheriff's Office. They'll ask what your issue, you know, what your emergency is. Uh, if you say it's medical, they will click the button that, that basically shoots your voice up to Coos, uh, up to Bay City's dispatch. They're still gonna be listening in to determine what other resources are needed. So if, um, and again, all this has to be worked out in the final, final detail, but this is what we're envisioning. They will be asking you what's your needs, um, assisting you with any medical response. So let's say you have a, a uncontrolled bleeding. They're gonna tell you how to control that bleeding while they get all the information. Uh, Delmar Dispatch will be listening saying, oh, well, he's out in Fort Dick, so let's go ahead and contact Fort Dick Fire based on the, the priority codes and all that that's set up by uh, emergency medical dispatch system. So everything will be happening simultaneously. Um, it just, they'll be able to, with the, eight, with the uh, satellite tracking systems on the ambulances, they'll be able to see what is the closest ambulance to your location and dispatch that ambulance directly to you. Um, but yeah, you should know it should be seamless. Just like if you were to dial uh, CHP right now, 911 on your cell phone, it goes to CHP in Humboldt County. You say, I have a medical emergency. They ship you up to uh, Del Norte Dispatch and they pick it up from there for you. So it should be very much the same. 
if our connection between the sheriff's office and uh, Bay City's dispatch fails, that's when the Dunlark dispatch would be uh, taking up the backup responsibility to, to make sure that units get toned out appro appropriately and, and uh, res respond to appropriate equipment. Does that answer your question? Well, I, uh, I, I guess it answers the, the question, but it doesn't seem like it's gonna take a load off of, of, uh, of our local dispatch. Uh, you you kind of indicated that this was gonna take a load off and I, I, don't, I don't see that happening in the scenario that you just gave. Well, the way it will, should dispatch, um, it should relieve dispatch of the issues. Once they know that it's, um, that their side of it's been taken care of, once they make that connection to coups, transferring the, the patient or the information up there, what will happen is, let's say a hospital calls and say, we have a transfer. So they'll just sw switch it right over to Coos dispatch and they disconnect, allowing them to go back to doing all their work. Whereas now they have to take, okay, where's the patient at? Where's the patient going? They have to set the tone, they have to tone out the ambulance. They say patients at ER going to, you know, Eureka. Um, then our unit gets on the air, says we're going to the hospital, we arrive at the hospital, we leave in the hospital to Eureka, and then when we get back, we have to say we're back in service. So all that transmission would be uh, deducted from their day-to-day -day activities. So that's where we're hoping that it's going to free them up a lot. The answering point, they are the, the uh, PSAP or the primary uh, public point answering service for 911. So all calls need to go through them. Um, for services. And after that, they're just farming out what they can to release their load as much as possible. And that's what we're, our goal is, is to make their, their other steps that they have to do uh, cut down in, in time management. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. I have yes. a question. Um, so th there's some would argue that relocating dispatch services out of the local area is a detriment. Um, because they're not familiar with our area. There's other things that come into play. Is, 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 are you not concerned about that at all? About somebody in Coos Bay or Coos County um, dispatching out, you know, go to Front Street, turn left, that sort of thing? Uh, no, because with the, uh, the CAD system or the computer data dispatch systems that they're using and the vehicle locating devices, as soon as that information comes up on the screen, they're gonna see more or less a Google Earth picture of, of where they're at and what's going on. So they, they should be able to actually aid us better um, through their system than what the local dispatch system can do now. Um, they're very limited on, on the technology that they're able to do as far as uh, that. The dispatchers we have now, some are from our area, some are not from our area. So uh, we've had the same problems of relying on that information. Um, but, you know, yeah, please understand that the uh, EMD system is not just something that you can go online and get a class on. It's, it's an ex intensive course. Uh, it's expensive course. And uh, it's required that you follow it under medical direction and you meet all these parameters and the North coast has to certify it for its approval. So yeah, we should be able to, our goal is to be able to get equipment and resources to a scene, the appropriate level. That's the other problem right now is just an all or nothing switch under the EMD. It says, well, you have a stub toe, you don't need a police car, a fire truck, an ambulance, and a dog catcher. Um, but that's everything that goes out right now because a call's a call's a call. Um, so our goal is that with EMD, they'll be able to say this is a level one or a level three and say, okay, well, we need this, 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 and this, and that's all um, gonna make sure that we're not putting excess resources out on, in the field that aren't needed to go. Okay, and that, that leads me to my other question is that currently now, and um, my dad was a CHP officer for a lot of years here, so this is who I go to. So this is, this is my knowledge base. But he appreciated as being a CHP officer when a call came out and he would roll up on the scene that the fire department was often always there first. So is this gonna eliminate that if somebody calls in for a stroke? Are we still gonna tone out our fire department who sometimes can, can arrive on a scene quicker? Absolutely. Um again, the, the high priority medicals will get the full fleet of everything coming. Um, but what it'll do is also free up our volunteer services out there so they don't have to respond to, you know, general leg pain, um, you know, that an ambulance crew can take care of. Um, so those are, and that's what the whole EMD is. It's a, like I said, it's, it's 
much more complex than I even understand. I, I know that we've tried to get it into this county for years. Um, as soon as we get people trained, they move on to greener pastures because they have that certification and they become quickly uh, gobbled up. So the, the county pays a, a lot of money to send people off to Utah to get that training. And then all of a sudden we, they're off in Santa Rosa or something else. So, so this way we're, we're being able to bring the service to the county um, and not have to worry about it costing or uh, it going away after it's been up for a week. So that's our goal. Thank you, Thank you for your Valerie, if I may, If I may add real quick, I, I promise you that these dispatchers will know the difference between Sand Man and Sand Mine of Elk Valley Road and Elk Valley Crossroad. Okay, that, that, that's, that helps me um, because again, a lot of my concern is our elderly people and I wanna make sure that they get their treatment as fast as possible. Absolutely. And so I, I do appreciate that. Mr. Chairman. Please. Uh, Mr. Pritchett, Mr. Sandler, um, the, my question, I have a few questions for you, but the vehicle locator technology um, is what I'm gonna ask about. Um, earlier this year, we had a, a call uh, to a elderly person who was choking and unconscious and the ambulance that arrived on scene was a BLS ambulance um, and it was quite obviously an ALS call and there was a um, ALS ambulance that was available. So I'm wondering this vehicle locator tech is is this something that the dispatchers are going to have at their disposal to, are they going to know which ambulance is a BLS versus an ALS and uh, dispatch the closest ambulance to the call? Is, is that something that's, that's coming on board as part of this uh, vehicle locator technology? Yes. Um, first of all, the, with the EMD, it will it'll do that screening right away and let us know if it's a full-on ALS or it's a full-on BLS type call. Um, we tend on our 911, we, we try to only use BLS if it's, if it's BLS calls, but without the EMD, it's hard to determine what those are all the time. Um, but yeah, with the, with the vehicle locator system, it will show every vehicle what their status is, um, what their level of, of service is, and, uh, and they'll be able to dispatch those directly. It may be a case where, where two ambulances are responding, where if the BLS is closest, because you know, choking is a, a BLS skill, that they can go ahead and start care until the ALS ambulance arrives on scene. Um, but yeah, that's, that would be our goal is to, to ensure that we're getting the right amount of equipment to the patient as fast as possible uh, and provide the highest levels of care needed for that level of, of care. Okay, thank you. Uh, I got a few more questions. Um, your online paramedics course that uh, you announced working through Metro West. Um, how, how does that work? I mean, we all know there's got to be some hands-on portion. It can't be completely online. Um, so I just curious as to, as to how that, that worked and how your, uh, your two employees are, are, are taking it. Well, they've just started and, and you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, we've been working with CR uh, beforehand, uh, to do online classes uh, so that uh, individuals did not have to make these endless trips back and forth to the other side of Eureka. Uh, that just wore people out. So really that's just uh, uh, something we've been working on already. And then yes, the, uh, the crew members will be going and doing hands-on training uh, as, as appropriate and as needed and to, to fulfill the, uh, the requirements to become a full-fledged paramedic. You know, another point, another point of that is even after they get done with their, their class, they'll have online class, they go actually to a location and, and practice like two, three weeks that they're going to be working uh, at different times throughout the class to uh, work on skills. Then they'll come out and work as a uh, third person on an ambulance as a trainee, um, getting enough contacts, work with the field training officer. But um, even after that, um, even after they get their state license and their national registry and everything, I've, I've made it very clear to Charles Tweed that no paramedic can work uh, on our ambulance unless they can respond to his family. Because if they can't respond to our families, we're not gonna let them respond to your families. Um, and that's, that's an absolute, because my grandkids fall down and need an ambulance today, I wanna know that that paramedic on that ambulance is doing the absolute best job anywhere in the world. And that's, that's the standard, um, it's not just a, a corporate, edict that we, yeah, we put good stuff out there and yada, yada, yada. It's, 
it's actual real world. It, it, they respond to my family if needed. And so I want the best. So. Thank you, Ron. That, that kind of leads me to, to a, a question I have. Being, I'm on the, the North Coast EMS uh, GPA and, and last, last meeting or meeting before we talked about the uh, core quality measures that uh, California EMS info systems put out a report on from 2019 uh, specifically talked about um, in, in the five counties that, that North coast EMS controls, there was um, one, um, I guess, relative downfall that, that the different ambulance companies were making. And, and, and specifically it was uh, glucose testing for uh, stroke victims or, or unconscious patients. Um, how does, how does your, how do you reconcile um, getting information like that? Um, and, and the reason I ask this is because we, we had a call the other day where uh, there was an unconscious patient and, and uh, the paramedic was reminded about this and, and they, they kind of discounted it and put it off um, like they could check the glucose later, um, maybe in the rig or, or something when, when it seemed like now was the time to check the glucose because we were trying to figure out why this this patient was unconscious. Uh, so I'm I'm just curious how you how your um, quality control or your 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 improvement structure is that would find information like this through the North Coast EMS and then disseminate it down to your paramedics. How how do you guys reconcile that? So um, we have a continuous quality improvement program that's been approved by North Coast EMS. Um, that program is in um, conjunction with, North, with uh, North Coast EMS and Sutter Coast Hospital where they review all our charts and they make sure that we're following protocols. Internally, we follow those, but when we get reports from individuals such as yourself saying that, that they saw something, they have a concern, that's another level of, of input that we seek all the time. So uh, we look forward to, to finding that information and then when those things pop up, um, we hold, we look at the cases and see if what the issues were. And if, if they were not following protocol, like they should be, we bring them in. If it's an individual issue, we deal with that individual. If it's a system wide issue, we deal with the system and hold like an, in, you know, like John was talking about our ongoing training program. Every two weeks we have uh, crew trainings and we'll bring those topics up. Um, in this particular case, I don't know you know, I, I can't speak to the case without talking to the medic on scene and find out what the rationale was for delaying that. I know uh, glu glucometry is a, a BLS skill now, so everybody should be doing it. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know why. Um, basically, when I went to paramedic school back in 1980, uh, we didn't have glucometers. So every altered level of consciousness is either considered drugs or sugar until proven otherwise. And if you did, treated those patients with that, then it had to be something else. Uh, nowadays, we have technology that can tell us what um, your breathing rates are and the amount of CO2 you're exhaling and the amount of oxygen you're saturating and the amount of sugar in your systems. And, you know, there's so much stuff out there that's, that is at our fingertips we should be using every single time uh, it's available or needed. And again, I can't speak why that paramedic didn't do that, uh, but I will find out. If you like, I'll get back to you and, and let you know. That would be fine. I was just wondering uh, what your what your mechanism was for your your quality improvement uh, uh, dissemination of information there. Um, you uh, you mentioned our our ominous last chance grade closer. I was just kind of curious. Um, you you mentioned your. Uh, relationship with Arcata Mad River. Curious as to how many times they were they were utilized. I know one time you you sent an ambulance down to Klamath and and they actually got stuck on the other side because the, the the hill came down behind them. But uh, I was curious as to how um, how many times mutual aid was called um, for Arcata Mad River in that situation and and also mutual aid from other agencies. How do you guys keep track of how many times uh, we ask for help for from AMR and Illinois Valley and, and Calor to the north? Uh, I don't have that off the top of my head. I mean, if that's something you'd like, we can find that information for you. Um, it's it's occasional. It's not like a daily event. Um, 
but when you have slides like that, uh, it changes your whole dynamics or, you know, there's, there was a time a few years back where we had all four ambulances. We had four ambulances on one day. We had all four of them on calls. We had uh, Calor coming in to run another call. We had AC or um, uh, AMR coming down to run a call. We had Arcata coming up to run a call. So we had like seven calls all within 20 minutes that popped and, and um, we're not, we're not going to sit there and hold um, patients or hold calls if just because we want to get the call. Uh, we're going to start resources. If we can free up an ambulance um, in time to take that other call or we can add another crew to a, one of our extra ambulances, um, we'll jump it and we'll let the crew, that other service coming in, let them know we got it. Thank you. And uh, let them get back to their service area. But yeah, I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but we can find them for you if you need them. I, I would be, I would be curious to, to have those numbers. And, and yeah, I do, I do understand sometimes the planets align and it seems like the world's coming to an end with all the tones going off. So I can, I can relate to that. Um, one more question, a couple more questions. Uh, how often, um, how, how often do you find yourself short staffed? I mean, I, I know when Metro West came and you started that partnership with them, there was a, a wage increase for your personnel and, and some upgrades of equipment. And I, I assume this was an effort to, to retain employees. Has, has that strategy, has that strategy been successful or how, I mean, how often uh, do you find yourself struggling to keep the three ambulances staff? It's a roller coaster. Um, you know, our goal is to add a fourth ambulance. And uh, just before COVID came along, we were right on track for adding that fourth ambulance to a full 24 hour service. Um, COVID came along and um, all of a sudden that roller coaster took a, a nosedive because uh, paramedics were getting offered jobs to go to New York, making, you know, 70 bucks an hour kind of thing. Um, so people were bailing on us, uh, bailing on the system in general uh, across the country to, to make some high, high dollars for short periods. Um, and we're starting to see that mellow out now. And again, our, our roller coaster is on the improvement. Um, like John said, we're, with our paramedic program, we're working on bringing EMTs, drivers on board, uh, getting them certified. We've got drivers going to EMT school. We've got EMTs going to paramedic school. That's the goal. Uh, the more that we can bring in locally uh, from our Explorer program, uh, the more likely that they're willing to stick around um, our community. Um, a lot like the other healthcare providers in the, in the county. Um, you know, younger folks want disco, not disco, but malls and nightlife and activities and stuff that we just don't have. Um, Charles works really hard at bringing people from out of the area that that are interested in the outdoor life, hunting, fishing, just enjoying the, our forest. And, and we have a good core group of those folks uh, with us now. And, and I think that they're here for the, the long haul. Um, but, you know, being a paramedic is a tough job. It uh, long hours away from family and friends. Um, so if you come here and you get like a recruitment to come here, a lot like other county jobs, you get some time under your belt and you become hireable to other areas. Um, that, Give you less hours, more pay, and you get to stay by your family. So that's a that's a battle we're always fighting, and, and we're never giving up. But we're just not filling seats with warm bodies. We're that's some of our problem too is to make sure that they're high quality people that are able to meet the mission um, at hand. We recently did an interview. We were very excited about this person, and then halfway through the interview, they realized that Crescent City wasn't in the Bay Area, <laughs> and that brought it brought the interview to a rapid conclusion so it, it, it is far, it's only that far on the map <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah uh but it's something that we're, we're cognizant of we're working on constantly it's, yeah we want to bring the right person here and we want to bring people here that want to make a commitment to a, for an extended period of time not just six months and and down the road they go and so you know delaware county doesn't fit everybody but for those people that it does fit it's a, it's a great place to live and with that's part of what we sell but they have to meet, you know, the necessary requirements, not only from a, from a licensing standpoint, but from a company standpoint and not everybody qualifies. Gotcha. Thank you for that. I just have, I know I'm going long here, but I just have one more question. Uh, at the North Coast CMS Mac, um, two, two or three uh, 
uh, meetings ago, uh, your um, attempt at getting an EOA uh, exclusive operating area contract was was mentioned. Can you can you tell us about that and what's the what's the purpose of of trying to get that? Well, uh, Humboldt County uh, entered into an EOA process for um, city ambulance and Arcade ambulance uh, a few years back. At that time, I asked, uh, should we do it? What it does is it really protects the county um, because by having exclusive operating area, it puts extra layers of um, focus on the service provided in the area. The benefit to us is that it is the exclusive. So, you know, while we're being watched uh, more in depth because part of the, the agreement is that um, North Coast would have a, uh, a uh, monitor watching our services, our times, our quality assurances, all those kinds of things to make sure that we're meeting the uh, every level of requirement. Um, it also gives us the ability to know that we're not going to have to deal with um, some of the bigger companies that are just looking for land grabs. Uh, I know like Eureka's big issue, why they put it in is because Falk was coming up from Santa Rosa. They just cherry pick some of the, the good calls. Um, and I say good calls or the transfer calls because they pay better than going behind Safeway and picking up somebody there. So, um, and that's what the EOA does. It prevents that cherry picking of, of services and ensures that the county gets the highest quality services um, available. The EOA, uh, the county can always withdraw the EOA um, anytime they want. So it's, it's not like once, once you've entered into it, it's you're locked in for life. Um, but it is uh, incumbent upon the, the provider to ensure that the highest level of care is provided all the time and to keep you happy with the services we're doing. Um, otherwise you can withdraw that. Um, you can be an open contract county, which means it's a free for all and you may never know what's gonna happen to your community. Or you can go out to bid, which then requires the county to, to bid every so often, um, a very expensive bid process. Um, and once you start that, you can't go back. Uh, Right now, we're at, a system, we're at a level where Del Norte Ambulance has been in place before 1985 or 1980, and um, they're allowed to be uh, brought in under the grandfathering of EOA, and that's, that's why we're asking for that. Uh, we're working on it. We're not quite there yet, making sure that there's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of hoops we've got to jump through before we can submit it to, to you. We just let Larry know that we were looking at it um, to do our due diligence on it to make sure it's something that we can do effectively and and uh, it's taken them, I think, three years, and they're still not quite done with the Humboldt process. So um, he's asked us to hold off until they get their process done. But um, once we get there, we'll go ahead and uh, you know look at bringing an application forward to you. All right. Well, thank you very much, John. I apologize for all the questions, but uh, that'll no that'll do it for me. I appreciate your your answers. Thank you. You know, I want to uh, jump in just for a minute and attest to the high level of service that, uh, and quality of service that they have. Recently, I had to uh, take advantage of Del Norte Ambulance, and they flew me from Crescent City all the way to more Portland, Oregon, OHSU. There were three people on board. Every one of them was really interested in how I was doing and how they could help me uh, in, in that particular, particular fight. So yeah, I never uh, had thought about Del Norte Amagens very much. In this case, it was a, a real lifesaver. Thank you, Bob. I, I wish we could tell more stories about that trip, but federal law prohibits it, so. <laughs> we, we, we can't confirm nor deny that we actually uh, saw you. So. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Um, Kylie, if you're with us there, can you please open it up for public comment? Yes, Chair. I'm just going to give it a couple seconds. Okay. No problem. Thank you guys again for joining us today. Uh, we don't usually get this engaged, but there's a tremendous amount of interest right now in, in what you do and the service you provide. So really appreciate your time and attention to those questions. Glad Chair, there are no you. hands raised online. Thank you, Kylie. Okay. I thank you. And, and again, I understand ambulance is one of those things that nobody wants to think about until they need it. Then they wanted it 10 minutes ago. So um, I, I get it. Um, and again, thank you for letting us come and uh, share what we're up to and, and how we're going to improve in the future.
You bet. Okay. Thank you again, John and Ron. See you guys. Okay. All right. We're going to go ahead and move forward with our general government items at this time. Item number 14 is discuss and give directions to cast official ballots for or against Crescent Fire Protection District special assessment as requested by County Council. Uh, Joel, why don't you take it from here? Yeah, um, so the fire district is doing a special assessment and the county as a property owner gets to vote. Um, unlike most taxes, public property is not exempt from a 218 tax, the special assessment. Um, so it's a little unusual to be voting, but uh, here we are. So there's five parcels. They're weighted a little bit differently. Four of them are 1.1 benefit units and one of them is three. So there's actually 7.4 weighted votes on the five. Um, you know, it just happens to be five. It's not like each board member gets one. Um, so unless the board for some reason wanted to say yes to some and no to others, I would say a motion for all five, yay or nay would be appropriate. Um, I, I'm sorry, Bob. I heard Bob I that he, he's making a motion there. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, if there's any questions I can answer them, if not. Okay. Jump in. We do have a motion on the table. What's, what is the motion? Bob, could you clarify for Supervisor Hemmingson, please? Uh, yeah, this is the direction to cast official ballots for the Crescent Fire Protection District. Yes or no? Yes. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. You got it. I'll second that. Thank you, Supervisor Hemmingson. Um, let's go ahead and open it up for public comment. Chair, I'm not seeing any. Oh, excuse me. One moment. Bill, you are on. Thank you. And thank you to the, the board. This is Bill Gillespie, fire chief for uh, Crescent City Fire and Rescue, which is the fire department that serves both Crescent Fire Protection District and the Crescent City Volunteer Fire Department under agreement. And I appreciate, I appreciate you know, the board taking the time to consider this. Uh, it's one of those one of those things that the the fire protection district's been in in service since 1949, protecting the the Greater Crescent City area or surrounding the city. Um, through those years, you know the the fire protection district receives a small amount of income or revenue from property taxes, and then in 1987 and again in 2006 established uh, benefit assessments. Um, the 2006 benefit assessment was specifically for the purchase of three apparatus equipment to outfit those. And those, all three of those remain in service today. In fact, we've just paid them off at the district, but that, that assessment sunsets this coming fiscal year, which essentially takes Crescent Fire Protection District back to a 1987 revenue level. And the, the combined, combined response out of, out of your fire department, the Greater Crescent City area last year was 2,057 calls for service. And that's out of a, a majority volunteer fire department. I'm the only paid member of the department um, <clears throat> that's here responding. The balance is volunteers. You know, we respond to the fires. We respond to all of those other calls that there is really no entity to respond to. Gas leaks, hazmat leaks, power lines, a little bit of everything. And then we also respond in conjunction with our local ambulance uh, to emergency medical services calls. Um, often because of where we're distributed, we do get on scene sooner in that, in that case. And we're able to start helping our community members. You know, without, without this assessment being able to go forward, the, the assessment amount that, that the district loses is about $110,000 starting next year. So this assessment has a goal to try and try and raise approximately 421,000. The balance of that is in, is is earmarked to work in conjunction with the 
recommendations of the 10 year fire department master plan that was conducted between the district and the city that really spelled out the, the needs, service needs for our community as we go forward, you know, including using this funding in conjunction with funding that the city will provide toward establishing a volunteer staffing program where we do have a staffed fire engine out of the Washington Fire Station, eventually bringing on three paid firefighter positions phased in one at a time over the coming years to help bolster that volunteer staffing program, bolster training, um, actually putting money aside to start building a vehicle and equipment replacement reserve fund. And, and we've, got, we've got real critical costs in the, like in our, within our station, uh, just the Washington station that houses the joint EOC, we're in desperate need to put a roof on this building to the tune of 70 to $80,000. Um, that can's been kicked down the, down the road a couple of, couple of years, but it's desperate. What it means if it doesn't prevail, if, it, if the assessment this time doesn't pass, and I say this time because we also went out last fall with an attempt. Uh, that, that assessment attempt did not prevail. It missed by 23 votes. Um, we won't see the fire district itself, won't see direct funding for Measure S at the city. That goes to cover the city jurisdiction portion. And the fire district also does not see direct funding from Measure R from the county as the, the fire districts are, are truly their own entities. And we, would, we receive a, a, you know, a small benefit through dispatch. And I know that was an earlier topic. Um, you know, I guess to sum it up off the last presentation, like the ambulance service, the fire department is something folks don't tend to think about until they need us. And then they needed us fast yesterday. And so, you know, in order for us to be able to continue with the, the level of service that our community has grown accustomed to and to be able to develop and go further, it, it is vital that the community comes out in, in support of the, this measure. And so, you know, I'm available for any questions, um, but I appreciate your consideration on the topic. Thank you, Bill. I do appreciate your time and joining us today. Kylie, is there any other public comments before we bring it back to the board? Chair, I'm not seeing any more at this time. Okay. Well, thank you again. Any further discussion amongst the board? I have quite a few questions. Um, and uh, Mr. Or Chief Gillespie, since you're on, if I could, um, if it's okay with the chair that I direct them at you. Absolutely. I'm here. Is that okay, Chair Howard? Oh, absolutely, Supervisor. Okay. Um, so I've given this so much thought. And, and so I do have some questions. They're not meant to be gotcha. I just want some clarification. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the city um, pays or the district pays to the city $401,654. What's included in those services? Okay, so those, those services fall under a shared services agreement between the district and the city. Um, Currently, currently, some of those things that come from that, that amount the district pays to the city, the, the district pays half of the cost for the fire chief, half the, the salary and benefited cost for the fire chief and our administrative assistant, the city pay, pays for the, the other half. Um, that amount that goes across, also we've got a, a shared equipment purchasing agreement where the costs are split between the city and the fire district for general tools, equipment, uh, the equipment that's needed to maintain the, the equipment on the fire engines, um, fire hose, that kind of thing, the medical equipment that we have to purchase um, because we don't, have a, we don't have a means or a method to really to, to bill at this point for like, oxygen, things like that. We're at the same mercy. The truck comes up from Eureka with oxygen bottles for us. But we share those costs. We share a lot of, we split a lot of costs on maintenance. Um, ladder testing has to occur every year. Pump testing has to occur every year. Um, we go, 
<laughs> yeah, we go through and share a lot of costs that way, and it cuts down on a lot of redundancy. Okay, yeah, it's just it's, it's um, highlighted as professional services. So I was just yeah. was curious what the professional services are. There is operations and maintenance and and equipment lease, but I just I wanted just some clarification what the services were, and you answered that absolutely. Um, my second question is when when it was determined that the uh, for the measure or the assessment um, mm -hmm. that we were going to get, we were going to hire three captains. How did you come up with that amount? Why, why was it three captains? And I know the history <coughs> was um, Steve Wakefield and how it was, he was a one man show and, and it clearly mm -hmm. was not good for his health um, as much as he gave to our community. But what, how did you develop the three captains? Okay. And, and it, it very much remains as Chief Wakefield saw it um, with the, with the call volume the benefit I have, I'm able to split between myself and we've got five uh, upper level officers in the volunteer ranks that help cover the duty on the weekend. So it, it gives everybody a split. So the, the three captains, what we did was, was looked at the reality of a, of a shift staffing program. And as we, as we developed the volunteer staffing program, to where we want to be able to get two to three volunteers into the station, the ability then to provide that leadership to help, really to help cover as the duty officer on single unit calls came down to being able to bring those additional positions on. Um, we looked at a lot of different models to go with that. So those, those three uh, as labeled captain's positions and they may evolve and, and be an apparatus operator when this all comes to be. We're not not 100 percent sure yet, but that's based on a, a 4896 work schedule where they would work when when all all the crews, all the, the captains are come on and are hired. Each one would work a 4896 schedule where they would work 48 hours on and 96 hours off. Um, that's a, that's a very, it's a modern and a contemporary model that's used by the majority of fire departments now. And it, it gives that blend of continuity to be able to get training completed, be able to get, take care of maintenance tasks and cleaning tasks within the department, um, prevention tasks out in the community, as far as like business inspections, uh, construction inspections. And then to ultimately to be able to provide seamless emergency response by always having in rotation, always having that crew available. And so looking at it, it made sense to go with, with a three um, and, and essentially base that off of, a, off of a modern fire department work schedule. Okay. And my last question for you is according mm -hmm. to the LAFCO report in 2015, and I know you weren't our chief at the time, mm -hmm but um, it reports that 75% of the calls to the um, fire department were medical in nature and 10 to 15 fire and 10 to 15 were not medical or fire related. Is that pretty consistent with your call volume now? It's fairly close to that. We're approximately 70%, like over this last year, we're approximately 70% of our call volume is related to emergency medical responses. And so, so the balance then, you know, we see, we see about between 10 and 15% fires. Um, our area tends to see a higher, higher level of, of fires based on, on a number of factors. A, a small percentage is homeless, but we, we still, we have the ability here to be able to have control burns. And one of those privileges we don't see in other areas of the state. Um, we, we run a higher number of fires than a lot of our neighbors further south. Uh, one of the things that we have done it, that ties directly with that, with that call volume for medical aids, we've worked with, by looking at, at North Coast EMS, looking at other dispatch centers, we've actually worked with the sheriff and dispatch here in order to be able to identify what truly makes up uh, what would be a life-threatening code three type call. Um, it was mentioned in, in the earlier presentation about emer emergency medical dispatching. Well, we followed those protocols and we presented it in a letter format 
to the sheriff. Uh, dispatch has, has streamlined some of the calls that we used to go to, leg pain, um, arm pain, those types of calls, so that the fire department isn't responding to those now. Uh, that'll continue to build it as EMD comes in or becomes more prevalent. And dispatch has actually extended that to the other fire districts within the county as well. Uh, but 70, it fluctuates 70 to 75% medical is, is our typical. Okay. So, and then now it's just my board comments that I want to say mm -hmm. is that I, I did in, take a lot of time over the weekend. I called pretty much everybody I know. So if you answered your phone, you got a chance to talk with me about this because I really wanted to, to hear all different versions and all different sides of this because um, for the, the cons on this is that people on fixed incomes are feeling the real pinch on this. Um, there's rising costs of everything. And while $74 a, a year isn't a lot for a lot of us, but someone on a, a fixed pension that combined with other increases, it's something that um, they have been concerned about. Um, another con was that it's just really bad timing. We just passed measure S and measure R and now we're asking for this. And then the last con that was repeated was that the voters had to sign their name on the ballot, which made some voters very uncomfortable. Um, but I weighed all that out with the pros and the pros on this is that we are one of the last uh, uh, counties that have a volunteer fire uh, system. And if we are not able to sustain that and keep them equipped with all the um, apparatus and things that they need, it's possible that that may go away. And if that's the case, then we're going to have to come up with ways to have a fire department and the cost that that's going to entail. Um, Ultimately, every person that is in my district, for the most part, that owns a house will be able to vote on this individually. So I don't feel that my collective voice needs to um, actually um, have that considered there. And my primary concern for this community is safety and the services that could be reduced um, if we have to reduce the, the fire uh, department's response is something that would be very, um, that would concern me for the safety. And the Board of Supervisor really needs to balance out the safety of, of our citizens. So for that reason, I'm going to be voting yes. Thank you, Supervisor. Any further questions uh, from the board? Not necessarily a question, but just a, a comment, just to dovetail on Chief Gillespie's uh, answer to uh, Supervisor Starkey's question about medical response. That 70% number is a pretty typical number nationwide. You'll find uh, that fire departments who respond to medicals will will do so approximately 70% of the time. So that's that's a pretty typical number for, for us and for all, all fire departments nationwide. Thanks, Darren. All right, let's go ahead and open up for public comment then. Chair, I'm just going to give it a few more seconds. And I'm not seeing any more public comment at this time. All right. Well, we do have a motion and a second on the table. Kylie, can you please pull the vote? Supervisor Starkey? Yes, sorry. Supervisor Short? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. All right, Bill, you have our seven point whatever votes. So thank you very much for your consideration to the board and thank you for your vote of support. You bet. All right, let's go ahead and move on with item number 15 on our agenda, which is approve and authorize the community development department to issue a request for proposals for a local roadway safety plan as requested by the assistant county engineer. Rosanna, you're on. Good morning. Good morning. So we have the local roadway safety plan, which is a planning level document to determine our community's needs. It's, it's very similar to the systemic safety analysis report we completed in 2019. Um, but as we wrapped up our systemic safety plan, the funding source changed the planning document that they wanted to utilize 
for the Highway Safety Improvement Program. So we're essentially doing a very similar plan to what we completed in 2019, um, establishing our needs as a community, reaching out to stakeholders, looking at collision data, and then coming back with a document to apply for future safety funding. So it's unfortunate that we have to do a very similar process again. Hopefully we'll get more out of it this time and we'll have a better document. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very similar to what we've done before. Does this overlap at all with uh, planning documents like the Illinois Local Transportation Commission go through for our community? It's similar. It, it's, it's, I don't know that it's specific to, to Highway Safety Improvement Program. That's where the funding comes from. And that's what the document helps to inform when we're applying for grant funds. Likely we could use this document for other funding sources, but it is tied directly to the Highway Safety Program. Yeah, I, I know when we just recently went through the, the, obviously the regional transportation planning efforts, a lot of county infrastructures identified in that process. So just, just curious how much overlap there is. Um, who was the contractor during the last planning process? Um, I think it was TJ Cam. Okay, thank you, Rosanna. Mm -hmm. Any questions from the board? Okay, let's go ahead and open it up for public comment. Chair, I'm not seeing any public comment at this time. Okay. Mr. Chair, move for approval. Thank you, Supervisor Hemmingson. Second. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor Short. All right, Kylie, please pull the vote. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Short? Yes. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. Thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on with uh, budget transfer items at this time. Uh, items 16, 17, 18, and 19, which is uh, budget transfer item 05-10 in the amount of 32000 with the miscellaneous revenue and expenditure budget unit, and item number 05-12 in the amount of 81500 within the jail budget unit, and then item number 05-10. 13 in the amount of $15,000 within the agricultural budget unit and item number 05-15 in the amount of 48,500 within the mis miscellaneous revenue and expenditure budget unit assessment. Mr. Chairman, I would move that we approve budget transfer 05-10, 05-14, 05-15, 05-16, 05-17, 05-18, 05-19, 05-20, 05-21, 05-22, 05-23, 05-24, 05-25, 05-26, 05-27, 05-28, 05-29, 05-30, 05-31, 05-32, 05-33, 05-34, 05-35, 05-36, 05-37, 05-38, 05-39, 05-40, 05-41, 05-42, 05-43, 05-44, 05-45, 05-46, 05-47, 05-48, 05-49, 05-50, 05-51, 05-52, 05-53, 05-54, 05-55, 05-56, 05-57, 05-58, 05-59, 05-60, 05-61, 05-62, 05-63, 05-64, 05-65, 05-66, 05-67, 05-68, 05-69, 05-70, 05-71, 05-72, 05-73, 05-74, 05-75, 05-76, 05-77, 05-78, 05-79, 05-80, 05-81, 05-82, 05-83, 05-84, 05-85, 05-86, 05-87, 05-88, 05-89, 05-90, 05-91, 05-92, 05-93, 05-94, 05-95, 05-96, 05-97, 05-98, 05-99, 05-2000, 05-2001, 05-2002, 05-2003, 05-04, 05-05, 05-06, 05-07, 05-08, 05-09, 05-10, 05-11, 05-12, 05-13, 05-14, 05-15, 05-16, 05-17, 05-18, 05-19, 05-20, 05-21, 05-22, 05-23, 05-24, 05-25, 05-26, 05-27, 05-28, 05-29, 05-30, 05-31, 05-32, 05-33, 05-34, 05-35, 05-36, 05-37, 05-38, 05-39, 05-40, 05-41, 05-42, 05-43, 05-44, 05-45, 05-46, 05-47, 05-48, 05-49, 05-50, 05-51, 05-52, 05-53, 05-54, 05-55, 05-56, 05-57, 05-58, 05-59, 05-60, 05-61, 05-62, 05-63, 05-64, 05-65, 05-66, 05-67, 05-68, 05-69, 05-70, 05-71, 05-72, 05-73, 05-74, 05-75, 05-76, 05-77, 05-78, 05-79, 05-80, 05-81, 05-82, 05-83, 05-84, 05-85, 05-86, 05-87, 05-88, 05-89, 05-90, 05-91, 05-92, 05-93, 05-94, 05-95, 05-96, 05-97, 05-98, 05-99, 05-100, 05-101, 05-102, 05-103, 05-104, 05-105, 05-106, 05-107, 05-108, 05-109, 05-110, 05-111, 05-112, 05-113, 05-114, 05-115, 05-116, 05-117, 05-118, 05-119, 05-120, 05-121, 05-122, 05-123, 05-124, 05-125, 05-126, 05-127, 05-128, 05-129, 05-130, 05-131, 05-132, 05-133, 05-134, 05-135, 05-136, 05-137, 05-138, 05-139, 05-140, 05-151, 05-152, 05-153, 05-154, 05-155, 05-156, 05-157, 05-158, 05-159, 05-160, 05-170, 05-171, 05-172, 05-173, 05-174, 05-175, 05-176, 05-177, 05-178, 05-179, 05-178, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 05-179, 09-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-
puts together a plan and a budget for uh, spending of the allocation that we receive uh, for AB 109 for public safety. Um, you have that report in front of you. Programmatically, really very little has changed from last year to this, except for the fact that we hope to actually implement things um, more effectively this year without a pandemic hanging over our shoulders. Um, so program-wise, as far as probation goes, um, DHHS, behavioral health, uh, the sheriff's office uh, holding PRCS 199 uh, offenders and others in custody, very little is, is going to change. We are seeing our budget, uh, our allocation coming in, our revenue going down slightly. Um, it's pretty stable uh, in comparison with last year. I think there's about a $30,000 difference. Uh, we are not getting growth funding because of the budget issues that the state is looking at right now. But locally, we should be able to cover our costs, uh, continue operating and um, the programs that we have been doing and uh, continuing operations there. Um, the partnership has uh, voted on the 13th of this month and approved the plan and the budget comes to the board for your approval as well. Uh, this is typically encapsulated in each department's budget that you uh, are looking at through the budget process. So each agency, sheriff's office, probation, DHHS, DA, public defenders, all of those have already incorporated these funds in their uh, individual budgets as well. Good. Thank you, Lonnie. Questions for Lonnie at this time? I just appreciated how thorough the report that you gave us was. I, I didn't have any questions, which is always surprising. So. Move yep. to approve the plan. <laughs> okay, we have a motion on the table. Second. Thank you, Supervisor Berkowitz. Uh, Carly, let's open it up for public comment. Chair, I'm not seeing any public comment at this time. Okay, we'll bring it back to the board with that motion a second. Can you please pull the vote unless there's further discussion? Okay. Supervisor none. Hemmingson? Sorry. Yes. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Yes. Supervisor Short? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. Thank you for joining us again, Lonnie. Have a great afternoon. You as well. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go ahead with uh, one of our last items here, which is our item number 21, fiscal year 2021-22 budget update from our CAO, Neil Lopez. Neil, you're on. And on mute too. Okay, we're, we're good at lip reading, but there you go. Now you got it. This thing's had some major problems over the last few weeks. <laughs> All right, thank you, supervisors. I just want to provide a brief update um, on the budget process to date and what you can expect coming forward over the next few months um, as we work towards our ultimate goal of the final adopted budget in September. Um, we've completed our first round of department uh, budget meetings, as well as discussion and consideration of any personnel changes that came through with those requests. Um, together with the auditor controller, uh, we plan to present the fiscal year 21-22 recommended budget for approval to the board at the next regular scheduled meeting on June 8th. Um, in addition to that, we hope to have an attachment that is also included in the information um, in, in regards to a spending plan or a proposed spending plan for Measure R. And we'll start, start that process for public comment and board consideration as well. Um, the last part of the budget update that I want to let you guys know about is that the county has now received its first tranche of the American Rescue Plan Act funding or the local recovery finance, local financial recovery funds, as you're calling it for the local level um, from the federal government. Um, the plan is to work with the auditor controller as well as Greg Burns from uh, Thorn Run Partners to determine what uh, allowable uses are of that funding and um, to bring uh, a report forward and uh, present uh, and provide a presentation to the board um, at the first meeting in July in regard, to the, in that, in regard to that funding and also start that process for public comment and community input um, as well and get some board direction on that. And that's all from me. Neil, quick question. On um, mm -hmm. 
what you're seeing from our departments, um, how much of an increase do you see department uh, wide in budget requests this year? I mean, is it are you seeing four, five, ten percent requests for increases now that we're getting asked every year more and more by the state of California to provide more services that they're not willing to provide? I mean, how's that in, impacting the overall? request by department heads and how's that impacting the budget uh, percentage wise that you're considering? Yeah, we, we do see requests uh, that have been increased, but it's, it's basically out of everybody's control really. I mean, with all the things that have increased, uh, you know, even with the minimum wage increases, everything that you're even purchasing through any of your departments uh, provide services to the community or other departments has increased. So our goal each year going forward with the budget is to try to control costs in our services and supplies budgets, which is basically, you know, any kind of materials we use, office supplies, uh, liability insurance, utilities, uh, those types of things. We try to control that cost as much as possible each year. The things that we can't control, of course, are uh, wages, you know, health insurance, um, unfunded liability for PERS, uh, PERS contributions go up annually. Um, so those are the costs that are kind of out of control of our departments. So the ones we can't control, we do as much as possible. We try to, you know, generate revenue where, wherever possible and make expenditure cuts wherever possible, but we have to do it and still be able to provide uh, services as, to this community. Yeah, I, I know, Neil, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I believe uh, you have and, and have looked at for now a length of time um, trying to provide the board with some solutions on that unfunded liability. And obviously under these state investment scenarios with CalPERS, the county has been paying a tremendous penalty for that unfunded liability of about seven percent per annum when they don't make their uh, when they don't make their number, and that's a huge hit to us. Um, I'm kind of curious, where are you at with um, trying to find some alternatives for the county to consider um, moving forward? Because uh, obviously, it's not sustainable. Well, we took the first big step towards that when the board approved the agreement with the California Municipal Advisors. Um, we have, uh, we're trying to do a poll right now of the Financial Management Committee members to set up a first meeting with CalMuni and start that discussion about uh, developing a pension uh, policy. So um, it's a pension funding policy and will be uh, to where everybody's kind of on the same page. The board is gonna be aware of the current unfunded liability and there will be some uh, difficult decisions to be made. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that, Neil. And I, I did want to repeat that. It is a part of an annual consideration for us. And uh, I think this board's going to be faced with a, a task here in the next year or two to really make some tough decisions. So I appreciate you re reiterating that. Yeah, uh, definitely. thank you. Yeah, other questions for Neil at this time? Okay. Let's go ahead and open it up for public comment. Chair, I'm not seeing any public comment at this time. Okay, well then we'll circle back to the board and uh, Neil, appreciate that update for that uh, fiscal year 2021-22 budget. No problem, thank you. Okay, let's circle back to the last item on our agenda. Thank you, Mr. Short, which is Items one through nine on our consent agenda. Is there a motion that uh, anybody's ready to make? Move to approve consent. Okay, we have a we'll motion second. and a second on the table. Kylie, any public comment? Chair, I'm not seeing any public comment at this time. Okay, very good. We'll go ahead and bring it back to the board for a poll vote. Supervisor Hemmingson? Yes. Supervisor Berkowitz? Supervisor Berkowitz, I think you're muted. Thumbs up or thumbs down will work too, Bob. <laughs> there we go. That's a yes, Kylie. Thank you. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Short? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. Thanks, Kylie. And with no uh, resolutions or proclamations to read, that would now conclude our uh, meeting. Our next meeting will be on June 8, 2021.
And I believe the board's going to go back into closed sessions for some additional discussion today. So uh, Neil, if you could uh, have Kylie or, or yourself send out that uh, link to us, I appreciate that. Um, will do. Okay. Thank you everybody again for joining us. We'll see you on June 8th. Have a great day.